Hello, and welcome to the Week in Green Software, part of Environment Variables brought to you by the Green Software Foundation. In each episode, we give you the most up-to-date news and events surrounding green software, a bite-sized smorgasbord of resources that will help you discover how to get involved in the world of software-focused climate action. I'm your host, Ismael Velasco. Hello, I'm Ismael Velasco, and this is The Week in Green Software. It has been indeed more than one week since my last episode, but I have been moving changing countries from UK to Mexico, and I am recording this from beautiful, sunny Merida in the peninsula of Yucatan. And I am more aware than ever of how vital is our mission. Perhaps the greatest obstacle to our planet's climate challenge is not really technical or technological, but collaborative. We are in the incredible position of knowing largely how to solve virtually all the problems in front of us. But how do we achieve the unity of vision and political and personal will to release our collective capacity to act? It may be considered that there are three protagonists to systemic change in society who need to act together. The individual, the community and its institutions. Indeed, we have enormous power as individuals in all the power that we have to connect, to create, to move. But there is a third protagonist, and that is the institutions of our society. Indeed, however much individuals and collectives and communities move to realize greener society and future, we cannot really achieve this change on the scale required by simply relying on creativity and goodwill. We also need institutional action. In this episode, I will look at a wave of upcoming green software legislation and standards, gathering momentum outside the notice of most commentators. It is early to say whether this wave of regulation and standards will take the form of a regionally focused tide or a global tsunami. But what seems certain is that outside of the awareness of most of us in the software community, we are in fact poised for a sea change in the regulatory landscape for green software, which in turn suggests we are poised for a genuinely dramatic expansion of green software with the associated opportunities and challenges. Check the episode notes for all the links. So here are some facts that I uncovered recently in working on the State of Green Software report for the Green Software Foundation. One is that the prevalence of software-focused legislation has quadrupled in a decade, with less than 10% of countries having such legislation in 2012 and nearly 40% having it in 2021. This is general software-specific legislation, not necessarily green legislation, but it's gone from 10% of about 120 countries, I think, to nearly 40% of them. This is according to the International Telecommunications Union. And this is topical this week as well, because just this week, the CSRD legislation from the European Union has been, from the CSRD legislation from the European Union, has been signed into law. This will dramatically increase the quantity and quality of environmental reporting and will certainly have implications for green software. But this is really something that goes well beyond just the EU. Of all of the countries with software-focused legislation, that 40%, nearly a third includes specific provisions for green software regulations. And this includes countries in Europe, Africa, Asia, and the Pacific. 
And this is merely the beginning. Green software regulations and standards are set to imminently and dramatically expand. At the 2022 World Telecommunications Development Conference, which is the global annual conference of the United Nations Technology Arm, the International Telecommunications Union, 127 national governments agreed, and I quote, to incorporate environmental indicators, conditions, and standards in their national ICT plans. This is regulation, resolution 66. And Europe is indeed leading the regulatory drive, not just with CSRD, but much more widely and much more comprehensively, with ambitions to influence the global regulatory landscape for digital emissions, just like they influenced the global regulatory landscape around data privacy. Specifically, the European Commission has stated that Europe, and I quote, will update existing laws and introduce new measures to achieve our green and digital goals for the next decade. The EU is also exploring voluntary and binding measures to help the private sector become climate neutral and use more renewable resources. The pressure, in addition to this general consensus that is really growing in the European Union, is becoming more and more prominent. So in the European Parliament, for example, the Green Party has made digital emissions regulations, specifically green software regulations, a central plank of their lobbying agenda with a massive petition sign. While the EU's foreign policy agency, the European Union Institute for Security Studies, has called for regulatory expansion in the green software arena with an explicit goal of influencing global standards. Green digitalization represents a strategic opportunity for the EU's foreign and security policy to exercise influence in times of geopolitical competition and trade tensions. So if you think of how EU privacy laws have affected the global landscape, when the EU rolled out GDPR, it created an unprecedented standard for citizen data ownership and empowerment and privacy. And although that was only legally binding on the European Union member states, 27 member states, it is such a large market block with so many people trading with the EU that first of all exporters began having to comply with the GDPR standards but secondly, it created proof of concept and critical mass so that more and more countries have developed their own versions of GDPR under that influence. And what the EU is saying, and particularly its foreign policy agency is saying, is that they want to achieve the same thing, that their green digitalization agenda is not just about regulating practice around software in the European Union itself, but about consciously and systematically influencing through its foreign policy arms the global practice in this area. What would this look like? Well, there are a number of initiatives on the way. There is a common European data space. There is legislation and development going on around cloud, around AI in the EU. There's the AI Act that is beginning to integrate sustainability into its concerns. But the EU is still in the process of shaping all this. However, individual member states have already made a start, and none more so than France, which has already started to roll out specifically green software legislation. The Digital Environmental Footprint Reduction Legislation, in French, REN, from its digitals, R-E-N, comes into force in 2023-2024 and comprehensively regulates everything from mandatory digital emissions disclosures, so that videos, for example, video streams, 
will have to have a counter of CO2 emissions. So if you're watching Netflix in France, Netflix will have to report not just to the government, but to the user on the environmental cost of its streams. But really, that's just one example of the range of mandated digital emissions disclosures to, excitingly, green software curricula across the educational system. They want to teach children and young people and university students about green software. And they are also mandating the prevention of software-driven hardware obsolescence, which is a subject particularly close to my heart, and all the way to a statutory duty for all local governments, all municipalities with 50,000 inhabitants or more to develop their own local green software strategies. This is huge. And it is merely one country and a highly influential country of the 27 countries that make up the European Union. So this gives us a taster, perhaps, of what is to come gradually over the next few years across the continent. Although Europe is certainly well ahead of the rest of the world, there are indications that Europe is not alone. In the United States, for example, the Securities and Exchange Commission is expected to greatly strengthen emissions disclosure requirements, which are said to include digital emissions, particularly under scopes two and three disclosures. And the degree of detail and the degree of rigor required is causing a bit of pushback in the digital industry specifically, because it is calling for truly comprehensive reporting. And likewise, this year, the Biden administration issued an executive order, 14067, if memory serves, that specifically mandates the U.S. government to undertake the preliminary work toward ensuring that digital assets in the U.S. are what they call responsible. And this includes specific discussion and a mandated study for the environmental impacts of software. And not just software in general, but they specifically mention blockchains and distributed ledger technologies. So this, again, is an indication of where the wind is blowing, as it were. The United States Federal Sustainability Plan is also likely to introduce further green public procurement around green software. And in China, the Environmental Protection Target Responsibility System has linked energy conservation and emission reduction targets to the performance assessment of government officials. And the evidence is that this has had a significant impact on the acceleration of green software innovation, leading to ongoing conversations on enhancing and honing mandatory environmental regulations for green software outcomes in China. And you can see this is beginning to be discussed increasingly in academia in particular, and obviously within China itself in the policy arena. And this trend toward regulatory action in the digital emission space may be seen not only at the general level, but also in a niche way, in terms of specific industry domains. So I mentioned the executive order's focus on blockchain. There are also initiatives around AI, for example, where the OECD advocated for, and I quote, widely used mandatory reporting requirements on the environmental impacts of machine learning, specifically calling for, and again, I quote, regulations, standards, and policies, including tax policies. The EU is also launching an AI Act, which will likewise include an environmental dimension. So we are seeing really that, that this is something that actually I haven't heard discussed very widely. 
I myself, even though the Rhin or rather Rhin regulation or legislation in France sort of kicks off now in days, I only found out about it very recently from talking to French colleagues in the Adora Foundation. So I think it is fair to say that this regulatory movement is probably not front and center of most people's radars, as it were. And yet it is coming. You can see that the French example of regulation will require so much work around standards, so much work around tools, so much work around education, so much work around deployment. As the EU rolls this out as a block, if you think of the amount of catch-up that had to be done with privacy and the kind of timeline and process and how GDPR was announced and then it came and then suddenly everything began to change. The green dimension of this European action of green digitalization, as they call it, is much more complex, I think, technically than the privacy challenges in many ways, certainly for us in the software space. And so I think this will actually influence a great deal of the commercial landscape, of the technical landscape, of the regulatory landscape, of the academic landscape around green software. And we are just before the beginnings of a step change. And so it is not surprising that in parallel with legislation, with regulation, there is an acceleration of standards development of green software standards. And I believe that this too will result in a transformed policy and regulatory environment. In this arena, I think efforts are more formative than in the legislation arena, but they do carry serious institutional momentum. As I mentioned, industry bodies are all speaking about the need for green software standards and at the moment, current or emergent green software standards focus on metrics, on processes, on software patterns, and on certifications. One cross-cutting factor in the emerging green software standard arena is the adoption of lifecycle assessment approaches to digital emissions and the incorporation of scopes one to three accounting. This means the direct and the indirect and the downstream environmental impacts of the products that we create. I think these standards on their own are useful and they are powerful, but in combination with regulatory demands, they will become incredibly important, incredibly impactful and draw a huge amount of attention. I see two tendencies in the development of green software standards. One is the repurposing of existing information communication technology standards. And the other is the supplementation of these existing standards with more specialized and granular guidance on environmental impacts of software. So as examples of the approach to greening existing standards, Generally speaking, I think the discussion around green information and communication technologies has very much focused on hardware. And so we do have quite a lot of standards already in the ISO and the ITU around all of the infrastructure, what would fall under scopes two and three emissions for us, of software itself because actually the emissions do take place at the hardware, at the machine level, has been treated, I think, as a minor add-on, as something that doesn't require much attention. The theory of change has been, for the last few decades, that if you improve the energy efficiency of hardware, then software 
will consume less energy by definition. And so if we focus all our attention on how to green hardware, then software will be green by default. The reality after all these decades is that we have it backwards, I believe, because we fail to recognize that hardware exists to enable software. Software is the end goal and the end product for which hardware is created. And therefore, software is the driver of demand for hardware, while hardware is the driver or the constraint of software. But hardware is not really the main reason to create software. You create software for business purposes, for society, for other forms of demand. Software is what drives the demand. And then you create hardware to make possible existing and future or desired software. If you say, I want to be able to communicate between Mars and the moon, you're, what you're really saying is, I want software that allows me to communicate between those spots. And for that software to work, I will need hardware that makes that possible. Because just installing the cabling, so to speak, does not allow us to communicate. And so what we've seen instead is that all of the tendencies, the data seems to suggest, seems to back up the idea of what's known as Jeevan's paradox, which is the idea that energy efficiency gains, instead of reducing consumption, increase consumption because they make more consumption possible. And as one example, the energy efficiency of data centers has been improving dramatically. It saw a dramatic improvement in the first half of this decade, and now it continues to improve, but in a more plateau fashion. So in theory, that should mean that we have much less sort of data center consumption, energy consumption. But of course, it's been the opposite. The curve in terms of consumption is the reverse. From a plateau in the first half of this decade, we see the data stored in data centers explode in an almost identical curve. The hockey stick becomes a U. On the left-hand side, you have the first half of the U, which is the energy consumption of data centers. And the right-hand side, you have the second half of the U, which is the data stored. And data is growing. And with it, net emissions. And so, for example, if you read the AWS Environmental Sustainability Impact Report, you will see that they almost complain because they're saying, yes, our net emissions have grown every year, but our efficiency has improved dramatically. The amount of carbon emissions generated per million dollars has been reducing and reducing, not at the same pace remotely, it has to be said. They have made 1% to 2% gains in efficiency year on year, but they've seen two-digit percentage growth year on year. So the net emissions keep growing, even though our energy efficiency at the hardware level keeps improving. And I think this is indicative more generally of a failure to put software at the center and not at the periphery. If software was designed in a way that took into account energy constraints, demand shaping of some sort, then the energy efficiency gains that we are seeing in hardware would not automatically translate into increased demand. And as an example, keeping to the example of data centers, recently Google did a study where they realized that dormant data on used projects in their cloud were 
generating some thousands of CO2 emissions. And so they came up with a software solution. And the solution was to create a recommender system that detects when a project in Google Cloud is dormant or unused, and then notifies the user to say, your project hasn't been touched. It is generating this many emissions. You may want to delete it or transfer it or modify it in some way. Now, that's a fantastic thing, right? It's a great feature. But in reality, if you think about it more carefully, it's not a feature. It's a patch. It's a patch on a lack of design thinking at the start. There is absolutely no reason why something like this could not have been part of the way users consume data centers from the beginning. And that data is a gigantic challenge for the planet and a growing one. I heard the other day that by some calculations, dead people will outnumber living people in the number of Facebook profiles. And that's all of their data still in there. And it's a complex issue. It's not a straightforward issue. You don't necessarily want to just delete everyone. You want to preserve their memory. But perhaps there are a lot of options between deletion and keeping them on high availability and digitally alive, as it were. The point I'm making is that if the kind of design thinking had gone at the software level to the same extent as it has gone at the hardware level in the data center industry, chances are that there would be a huge amount of energy savings without any loss of functionality. That data is dead, is dormant in the projects that Google Cloud is referring to. It will be dramatically bigger in AWS, which is dramatically bigger than Google Cloud and Azure again. There is so much data there that could be moved or deleted, but no one thought about it because the idea was you optimize the hardware. Instead, what we've seen is that when the hardware gets optimized, we just go, oh, that means we can store more data. Then it's easier. We've got less constraints. It's not that we've achieved greater savings, it's that we can enhance demand. So in reality, it is in how we design our software, how we think about the scope two and three impacts of software, of how we make design decisions around our software products that take into account the downstream hardware use and infrastructure that will ensure that any gains in efficiency will not necessarily translate into net increases in emissions. And so this is where these standards become very important. And a lot of the standards that already exist is so 14001, the Environmental Management System Standard, or the ISO 14064 for Greenhouse Gas Management and Verification Standards, or the ISO 26,000 social responsibility standards. All of these standards are now beginning to be harnessed. They could always have been used for software, but they haven't. Traditionally, they have focused on hardware. There is now movement around beginning to adopt them to verify and to green software itself. The closest existing standard in the software arena, in terms of ISO standards, would be ISO 25010, which is the software quality standard. And the growing literature around its implications and limitations in terms of green software. So already there is one movement that has used green software dimensions that are already implicit in ISO 25010 and have been increasingly emphasized as environmental tools. So performance efficiency, resource utilization, maintainability, portability, usability. This criteria of that ISO standard 
which had been originally conceived outside of an environmental framework. They had been originally conceived purely from the point of view of software quality and performance are now being co-opted into green software discourse. There is also recent addition to the ISO standard that specifies the degree to which a product or system mitigates the potential risk to the environment in the intended context of use. I don't think this standard has actually been used greatly for green software, but it is beginning to be, and I think it will be probably used a lot more in light of the regulatory pressures and the market pressures that are growing for green software. Existing standards also come into play when it comes to calculating scopes 2 and 3 emissions of software. And this is where actually the core of the standards, for example, of the, I think there's about 150 sustainability related ITU, International Telecommunications Union, the UN arm of technology, that are particularly likely to guide the approaching wave of national policy and strategies and legislation. And these standards focus on impacts and metrics and best practices around software-related infrastructures, such as data centers themselves, servers, networks, client devices, cabling, the entire infrastructure that makes software possible. And so as we start thinking about the scope two and three emissions of our software product, these kinds of standards may well come to our aid in thinking about how our software interacts with hardware to consume electricity and generate emissions. And work is currently underway to translate these standards, which have been generic, societal as it were, to the individual organization and services level. So the ITU is now working on not just how do you demonstrate this at the specific hardware level, but at the business level, how do you harness these standards to say, my product is green, my company is green, my service is green, and translate it into future national ICT strategies. Remember the 127 countries who pledged to develop them. These organization level standards may well have regulatory impacts for companies around the world. And at the same time, there is work to develop new green software specific standards. So examples of these are, of course, the Green Software Foundation's own software carbon intensity specification, which we explored in the fact check episode of Environment Variables. This new software carbon intensity specification is already impacting industry and academia and is likely to become at some point an ISO certification, or at least that's the aspiration. Work is very early on this. The ITU has also released guidance and criteria for information and communication technology organizations on setting net zero targets and strategies. And there is ongoing development at the ITU on how to quantify the greenhouse gas contribution of ICT at the organization level. W3C, one of the leading bodies for standards around the web, is doing ongoing work right now to draft guidance on sustainable web design from design patterns to metrics. And Germany has released, and in fact issued, I think, the very first certification recently under its Blue Angel accreditation, also around green software. So you can see that that movement is happening. I think the last thing to mention, although it's probably worth an episode of the Week in Green Software in itself, is that behind and beneath and around these regulatory standards processes that institutions are building, you are seeing that for the first time in 2022, sustainability rose to the top 10 concerns of CEOs in the Gartner survey. It was the top eight concern. And likewise, Gartner identifies sustainability as a cross-cutting theme of technology innovation in 2023. And 
this is partly because of the need of the planet. This is partly because of wanting to save on costs and save on energy, particularly after Russia's invasion of Ukraine and the energy impacts that had. But a lot of it is also, I believe, anticipatory of this kind of regulatory movement. And the regulatory movement that institutions are driving extends also to what is known as sustainable public procurement or green public procurement or green public purchasing or sustainable public purchasing. And it's the idea that more and more governments are choosing to develop environmental standards for purchasing products. And that movement toward environmentally informed procurement is rapidly accelerated around software specifically. And this matters again, how governments choose to purchase counts. Governments around the world spend an estimated $11 trillion in public contracts every year, representing approximately 12% of global GDP. At a national level, this varies even more. So some governments will spend no more than 2% or 3% of GDP, but other governments purchasing represents up to 57% of GDP in some countries. So how governments choose to purchase has a significant impact. And a 2021 World Bank study found that 53% of national governments had provisions for green public procurement. The percentage and maturity of green procurement regulations varies by region, with 90% of European and Central Asian nations having such provisions compared to 21% of African governments. So the level and the spread of this is quite varied. But basically, 53% of 149 countries reviewed had some form of institutional arrangement for green public procurement. So this is something that already exists and that is growing and that is gathering momentum. And in 2017, a United Nations Environment Program survey found that of those governments that had green public procurement policies in place, 89% placed office IT at the top of the green procurement agenda. Now, the way the survey was constructed, this focused is specifically on hardware, on equipment bought at Office ICT. And this is where the core of green procurement attention was on the purchase of greener office technology. But this is now beginning to expand into the software arena. So the Law and Digital Sector and Environment on Responsible Computing from France includes an obligation for a large part of public buyers to take into account the durability and repairability of digital products. In the UK, the very first objective of their greening government ICT and digital services strategy 2020 to 2025, their first objective is only procure with suppliers who have committed to or are in the process of setting science-based targets that match departmental sustainability outcomes. In Finland, their climate and environmental strategy for the ICT sector aims to, and I quote, develop energy consumption verification methods, certificates for software-based services in support of environmentally friendly procurement. I think this is very linked to that shift in attention that we've seen in standards more generally. The recognition that we need to create green standards, not just for the hardware that makes software possible, but for software itself, because software is what will determine the downstream use, demand, and even design of hardware. So I think this tells us that institutions indeed are a key protagonist, along with the great individual innovators, along with big and small business innovators 
and their own decisions around purchasing, your decisions around the software you purchase, your conversations with your company's owners and managers around how they procure software, all of these things count. But really, you can see how much more powerful everything is when the institutions of our planet come together to act. And I think it is important to say that they haven't acted yet. Not really, not at scale, not on the whole. France will be one to watch extremely closely this year as the point of the spear. But I think what I have discussed shows that this is part of this civilizational shift, that institutions, just like businesses, just like individuals, slowly, painfully, inadequately, are nevertheless shifting. Like turning around a massive ship, it cannot be done simply by turning the wheel and for it to change. It takes time. But that the movement is beginning, is happening. And that the key is in the integration of those three protagonists. At the moment, I do not believe we are really moving together. We have individuals, we have communities, and we have institutions moving in this direction. And it is indeed inspiring. And perhaps the greatest gift the climate challenge is giving the world is that in a moment of maximum global fragmentation, conflict, polarization, disagreement about the very nature of reality, what constitutes a fact, the climate challenge is bringing us together. Good luck in your green software adventures. Hey everyone, thanks for listening. Just a reminder to follow Environment Variables on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. To find out more about the Green Software Foundation, visit greensoftware.foundation. And please, if you liked what you heard, do leave a rating and review. It helps other people discover the show and join in the conversation. The more of us are exploring these issues at home, at work, in our free time and in our projects, the greater our chances of taking effective action and making a difference in our own corner of the world. Good luck in your green software journeys and see you in the next episode.